report on this computer and we are recording. Good morning, Dr. Tom Larkin with Dr. Chris Griffin and Roberta Weber. This morning, we're gonna talk about something very specific here in the Phoenix Project, because as this thing unfolds, you know, it just has layer after layer and I wanna take a, a real topical issue and, and it's consumer behavior. That's what I'm gonna talk about. I kind of have a funny story to, to uh, pass along. Trying to identify who this consumer is and what they're going to be like in 60 or 90 days is, is I think any smart business person needs to know what that thing's going to look like, right? So here's what, here's my story. So one of the things I noticed about a, uh, a week ago was my wife said that she did not want to order DoorDash or Uber Eats, okay? She didn't want random people coming to our house. And I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, just uh, she would prefer to go pick it up, have them put it in the trunk, bring it home. Uh, oh, and here's another potential business. If they could make flavored Lysol, uh, that would be a great business because she's taking those bags and hitting it with the Lysol. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. So, so anyway, so I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, then, you know, I had mentioned in my webinar before a company called Brain Reserve, you know, been around for 40 years, Faith Popcorn, Fortune 500 companies pay her millions of dollars to look at trends. So in 2008, I really studied what she was saying about the 2008 recession. And so I kind of revisited her Twitter account. And, and sure enough, yesterday, this is what she said. And she's talking specifically about Uber. She said, the gig economy is going to suffer. It will be harder and harder to make in-person deliveries for fear of contagions. People will not trust Uber drivers. Okay. So I thought, well, maybe my wife's natural instinct of not trusting a random person had some validity because she's saying this is going to be a trend and she's been spot on on a lot of things so then she said there's a room for a new gig career this breed of gig drivers will have to be tested and report negative results and i thought well isn't that interesting and that immediately pulled me back to 1988 when i wow. put in the, the hiv protocol in my office and one of the things that we did was testing of the staff and the doctor. And it was really, uh, that was a very tricky thing to do because I mean, it was voluntary. You couldn't force people mm -hmm. and we did it quarterly, okay? But my whole concept back in, in the HIV crisis was patient comfort. Pa patients have to feel comfortable coming to the dentist. And so I identified all the points. But this whole thing about testing, now here's the point. We don't have testing in place. We don't have point of care testing, okay? I think we will in six to 10 months really quickly, like something, a device that'll be in the office. I mean, the, the one that Abbott Labs has looks like it's a quick test. So, so I sat down and I revisited my protocol for, from 1988. And I said, what we need to be thinking about, okay? I'm trying to think ahead now, because I see the writing on the wall. I see my wife's behavior, I see brain reserve, and I said, we need a patient protection plan, a COVID-19 patient protection plan that we post in the waiting room, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm adding to this. And so what I want us all to do over time is to develop this, okay? Because this was just off the top of my head. So number one was all staff and doctors will have their temperature taken daily, okay? Mm -hmm. That'll probably be a standard protocol going forward. Now, this is the one that gets tricky. All staff and doctors are tested for COVID-19 weekly, okay? Probably not daily, but weekly, point of care, you know, five minutes, just to be sure that everybody on your team at that moment in time, right? All surfaces are disinfected continually during the day. Mm -hmm. Our facility is completely disinfected each evening. We utilize CDC recommended PPE, our water system is filtered and sanitized. Okay. Our air system is filtered and sanitized. Um, hand sanitizer is provided at check-in and check-out. And then the last part here, because this is kind of what this is looking like for me, is that we utilize an ultra clean, ultra green approach, because I'm, I'm really honing in on these ozone technologies. Uh, we just got set up um, in our offices yesterday. And so, um, but anyway, so this whole thing of having Kind of a mantra this is this is our goal and and i think we need to i think we need to talk about that because there is no question um the consumers are going to be looking for this <clears throat> so any input on that whole concept of uh, uh the fear of contagions 
I can start because that was so much in the conversation that I had with the free practices this morning on, um, you know, getting the whole team collaboration on providing ideas to what it will take for them to feel safe yeah. coming back to the practice and also creating that safety to the patients as well. So in addition to everything that you brought it up, we talked about maybe professionally installing some of those clear on um, protections with plastic, the flexi plus into the reception area, like they're doing in some of the supermarkets, because the reception area is not as protected with their gear as the clinical staff is. Um, and a conversation came about UV light. Okay. And how would that, for an instant, the mail is coming and there's envelopes coming on um, what do we run everything through an UV light before we touch anything? Right. And how, what is that efficiency? Will that put in an additional safety net for everybody? Sure. Uh, you know, definitely doing the daily sterilization of the whole practice. We've talked about, especially the offices that have multiple treatment rooms. It obviously is going to affect how many patients we'd be treating per day. But the idea was that we are in treatment room number one, the next patient goes into two and three and four. And if possible, depending on the number of patients that we're rotating, that each treatment room doesn't get utilized for a couple of hours, just to allow the completely disinfection so we're not just jumping into the same surfaces. Right. And we did talk about possibly wearing the, you know, the hair netting, anything that is going to make sure that the surfaces, uh, everything is protected, on uh, doing the disposable gowns. Yeah. So everybody will be wearing disposable gowns. We talked about maybe having patients do a, um, a rinse right. to decrease, uh, you know, when they walk into the practice and immediately having them gloves on and mask when necessary. So, I mean, it's just kind of like really thinking about what can we do on right. and having those written requirements uh, to be shared with all the patients in advance. So right. they know everything that the practice is doing it to be proactive. Right. The second part that came out of what you're saying is where is that consumer is going to want to spend the money? Yeah. So number one, if there's a scarcity of money, I'm going to put it where I trust and I see value. Right. So having all this in place is going to create additional value and additional trust. Right. But meanwhile, one of the things that I had this idea yesterday, and I think it's going to go very, very well, is that we have tons of Listerine, you know, it could be a polygrit. We have fluoride treatment. We have toothpaste, toothbrushes sitting in our shelves right now. And I think that action speaks a lot higher than words. Yeah. So what I suggested for them, we did a filter on patients who are overdue for hygiene and that maybe send a care package nice. with a love note from the practice saying, we care about you and until nice. we can see you, Here's something to keep you by. You know, if there are patients who are have unscheduled treatment plan for restorations, in particular, one of my practice that's a pediatric practice. You know, is there any fluoride that we can ship it to them? You know, even if it's a prescription strength like a private end or something like that. On um, when the kids are high risk and has a lot of carriage to be filled. On um, and this is not only to help the patient base, but also to create the relationship of care. Yeah. You know, I had thought about even something as simple as sending a toothbrush and a note that says, do you realize that you need to replace your toothbrush? You know, we've always talked about the need to replace your toothbrush every three to six months because it gets mm -hmm. going up. But now it's, now you have a chance to message around the fact that, did you know your toothbrush is pretty dirty, yes. right? So I, I think those are brilliant ideas. For, you know, so we talk about projects during the layoff there's one that could be really truthfully as simple as just sending a toothbrush mm -hmm. and having a touch point to the patients and saying, we're thinking about you. Hey, throw your toothbrush out. You know, this mm -hmm. is a good idea. Here's a new one. Yeah. Awesome. Chris, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I'm, I'm coming at this from the practice management side. Um, we, you know, it, and I think it would be, uh, you know, it'd be great. Anything we can do to, to do the psychology angle, to, to ease the mind of the patient, to get them to come back in. Yes, we've got to do that. But I, we also need to make sure that we don't come up with such a, a crazy bill of 
whatever we're coming up with that needs right. to happen for each practice, that it yeah. scares the dentist to the point that they say, whoa, I'm just, I'm just not doing it. So right. it's going to require a good amount of leadership and we're going to have to really, you know, use our brains to come up with the best flow of things. And right. also we need to try to think about cost because we don't have any income coming in right now. So right. we've got to, you know, we've got to figure out what things we can spend money on that get the biggest bang for our buck. And right. uh, yeah, no, you're working on all that. Yeah, everything that Roberta talked about, you know, I, I, I mean, like you, I'm thinking, okay, that's going to cost money. I mean, all these things are going to cost money. That's why I was hoping that the SBA thing had a little more cushion in there for retooling because it doesn't, at least the PPP does not look like there's anything there. I don't even know about the other route. That looks like a very long convoluted route, the other loan, right? Because right. I, I think we do need, uh, for certain, the average dentist in 60 days from now is not going to have money to go do most of these things, right? They're, they're gonna open up and just, mm -hmm. uh, in a wing and a prayer and hope that people start trickling back in, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the tough part. Also, you're gonna have to, another aspect, you're gonna have to really look at the leadership. So the, the leadership of the practice is gonna fall back on the doctor. Um, if you expect your assistants to do more of these things that they haven't been doing before, right. or if you're gonna expect them to you know, do something like you said, the testing, temperature taking, it's going to yeah. require quite a bit of leadership on the doctor's part. So we're yeah. probably going to have to give people the tools they need to present this stuff to their teams to, yeah. to get them on board. No, and, and you know, you and I, we've, we've used the word flexible a lot, flexible. Uh, if you don't have people that after this experience are dialed into being flexible, that's not the right person because we're, we're all in this boat that's got a little bit of a leak and we, we all need to work uh, together so that we can make it to shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And when I talked to a couple of my offices this morning, immediately I could spot, and it was so obvious when you saw who are the people on the team that immediately step up yeah. and show, you know, this is, even if I'm doing as a volunteering, this is how I'm going to guarantee that my job is going to be there when we're ready to come back. Yeah. So most people are very proactive. They know their patients either volunteering to reach out by phone call or saying, okay, I can go online, order the supplies, ship to my house. And we said, you know what, if everybody's doing 25 care packages, let's just do a beta, you know, beta testing out there, see how that is responsible by your patient base. Yeah. And it, there were a couple of people that we knew already. They were just saying, I'm not interested. This is my free time. Yeah. I, and the reason why it can't be done. Yeah. Now, sure enough, those are the ones that are not coming back. Yeah, they, they, they've self-selected. So, so these teams, yeah. maybe, maybe because of the PPE, these teams are going to be smaller, maybe more self-selected, and, and mm -hmm. people will kind of sort themselves out. Don't you think, Chris? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, the ones that are not eager to come off the unemployment line to come back to work, uh, that's, that's kind of self-selection in and of itself, right, Tom? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for taking the time. I know you both are super busy and I thought maybe once a week we get together and just take something topical and just explore it a little bit. Because like I said, this has so many layers. It's so dynamic and it's, you know, it's changing. So we need, we need real time information. You know, we're all, we're all working to a degree in real time trying to figure this out. And that's the whole purpose of the, of the Phoenix Dental Project is to be relevant, you know, because right now people are, are not really knowing what to do with their time, but, but, we are trying to be innovators and look ahead 60, 90 days. So we'll just do that on a regular basis. And I appreciate both of your time so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, looking forward to it, guys. All right. Yeah.